Well, hello there, everyone on Facebook. My name's Clay Wirestone. I'm the communications director at Kansas Action for Children. Um, I am joined here today by our director of policy and research, Emily Fetch. Say hello. <laughs> Say hello, Emily. Hi, everyone on Facebook. Okay. Great. Um, so this is the first of what I am calling for now, KAC Conversations. And the idea is it's a way for us to check in with all of you, uh, see how things are going, uh, see what's happening in, uh, in your lives and in the world, as it were, and also how that connects with our work here at, at Kansas Action for Children. Because even though all of us are now working from home, as, as you can see from my surroundings and from Emily's, um, we're continuing to do our work and we continue to think that this work is really important. Um, so I wanna start off today by sharing a couple of resources that we've put together over the last couple of weeks. Both of these are posted on our website at kac.org. And there are a couple of different blog entries. The first of them, is titled Resources for Teaching and Learning at Home. It was put together by our Director of Organizational Effectiveness, Jamie Jones, and it includes a bunch of different links and resources for parents who might be uh, at home with their kids now, with their kids out of, out of school because of various shutdowns. And these are just different activities, different ways to engage your kids during this time. Because goodness knows there's gonna be a lot of this time uh, coming up. Uh, the other resource uh, that also came from Jamie and that we posted just this week is called Making Working From Home Work For You. And it's a collection of advice and various tips about how to actually do the work from home thing, how to set up uh, uh, home offices and how to make sure that organizations are still effective while you're, while you're doing that. Uh, Jamie also is available for any organization that might be looking to do this or isn't exactly sure about their next steps. Uh, you know, feel free to email her at Jamie at that's J A M I Jamie at K A C dot org. Anyway, both of these uh, blog posts are available on our website now. We encourage you to drop by there. We also encourage you to just follow all of our social media channels now because we're trying to put more and more information out that way because the way that we would like to be seeing you all now which is face to face and one on one it's a little harder for us to do um so with all of that being prologue uh we thought we would talk a little bit today about some of what the federal government is doing and what it might mean for Kansas so Emily tell us everything that's going on <laughs> <laughs> uh, so today, um, just a few hours ago, the House passed the third kind of federal response, federal package response to COVID-19. Um, uh, so it was passed by the Senate on Wednesday. The House passed it this afternoon, and so now it's on the way to be signed um, by the president. And this bipartisan bill um, is a really important step forward to getting direct assistance um, to those who need it most, but there um, still remains a lot of things left to be done um, in terms of kind of critical gaps with healthcare, childcare, and um, additional work that can be done around food assistance. But it's definitely a good kind of step in the right direction in terms of addressing the immediate needs. So just to, just to be um, clear here, there have been a couple of other coronavirus <laughs> response bills passed before this one. This is by far the biggest and the one that's most directed to everyday folks. So whereas some of the earlier ones dealt with the medical system or dealt with some other things along those lines, this one actually includes direct payments to folks. So I wondered if you could maybe break, break those down just a bit. Yes, you're absolutely right. So this bill is um, both probably the most kind of comprehensive and what it um, does kind of for everyday Americans. Um, the, the bill of it, it's a $2 trillion bill. Um, so uh, there's there's a lot, a lot going on with it. Um, other bills um, previously had been working to address kind of um, corporate bailouts, 
and other components. And this definitely um, does more kind of for everyday Americans in terms of the direct payments. And getting uh, people cash <laughs> into, their, into their hands is really critical because we know that there have been massive layoffs. And so people need to continue to pay their rent and their mortgage, keep the lights on, meet basic food needs, all of those things. And so it's really critical that we're giving kind of direct assistance to folks. Um, and we also know from lessons learned from the Great Recession and others that it's really these direct uh, assistant payments um, that are much do a much better job of curbing an economic uh, downturn than kind of the corporate bailouts that we were seeing in the previous bills. So as the bill stands right now, the direct payments will be a one-time payment. They're expecting the money to go out on April 6th, but there has been um, kind of some pushback to maybe try and do it sooner, knowing um, that there's a, an immediate need. So for folks, um, for single filers that are making under $75,000, there'll be a $1,200 um, payment per adult and $500 um, per dependent uh, years 16 and under. Um, and then there's, a, there's kind of a, a phasing piece um, between kind of $75,000 again for a single filer to about, um, about $100,000 um, for uh, other folks. And then if you're making more than that kind of 100, I think it's actually 99,000, then you, you won't be eligible, but it's certainly helping a huge chunk of um, the population with a, a direct assistance. Um, and now we, we also have a, uh, a comment here that I think um, brings up one of the possible shortcomings of this, which was there's, there's a question about do these everyday folks include those who um, aren't U.S. citizens? Yeah. And I, th I think the understanding is if you don't have a social security number, you're mm -hmm. not, would, you would not receive a payment under the bill as it stands. Is that right? Yeah, so while this is a, a good step in the right direction, um, that comment is absolutely right that there are definitely groups that have been left out. Um, so, uh, you know, I mentioned that the dependents are defined as 16 and under. So that means that um, 17, 18 year olds, maybe, you know, young college students whose parents might claim them as a dependent, as the bill stands right now, they would not be eligible. Adult dependents. Um, are not eligible for um, the direct assistance. So that's one kind of category that's being left out. Um, the second one, which the comment mentioned is I-10 filers or um, folks without a social security number, undocumented folks would not be eligible um, for the assistance. And then the third category of folks that would not be um, eligible as the bill stands right now are folks who have not um, who did not file a tax return. So the way the direct assistance um, is coming through is it's the rebates based on prior year's income. So if you filed um, a 2019 or 2018 tax return, um, that's how they're going to determine kind of what your rebate is. Um, so while there are some folks who didn't file um, like uh, social security recipients, they wouldn't necessarily need to file to get the rebate, but most other non-filers won't get immediate assistance, even though they're el eligible. And what we know about people who aren't filing, that is um, primarily low-income folks who do not have a tax liability, and those are most likely the people who really need it the most um, right now. And so uh, the, fe the federal government, the Trump administration, um, can make it easier for people to get these payments without filing a tax return. Um, and so there is some adjustment that can be done through Congress to make sure that all people get help, regardless of whether they file the tax return or regardless of their immigration status. Um, the other, th so speaking about various aid that uh, might be flowing to folks, there are these direct payments, but then there's also a fairly substantial boost to uh, unemployment insurance that's included as well. Is that right? Yep. Um, so uh, the federal bill expanded unemployment insurance from three to four months. Um, it also is providing temporary unemployment insurance for uh, up to $600 per week. And that is in addition to um, kind of all of the normal unemployment insurance um, benefits that you might receive at the state and federal level. So it's on top of what already exists. And, and one of the things that is also really good about this unemployment insurance is it um, includes people 
uh, types of workers who aren't always included in kind of the um, kind of normal or traditional unemployment insurance. So it includes self-employed and gig workers. And we know that that's really important because those are some of the folks that are taking the hardest hit right now, right? Like Uber drivers, that sort of thing. Um, and the other uh, kind of important part that's helpful is that um, it is uh, allowing employers to get an advance on that rather than a tax credit. Because again, we know that people need um, the, the money in their pockets right now, um, not kind of at the quarterly, uh, kind of a quarterly or yearly tax credit. Um, so uh, the unemployment insurance kind of uh, broadening both in terms of length of time, increasing the amount, and then really expanding who is eligible to receive it um, is definitely a positive step. And right. in Kansas, um, it's, you know, we've seen that unemployment, and I mean, this is true nationally, but it's also true in Kansas that unemployment claims have skyrocketed um, in the past week. So last week we saw that there was an increase of more than 1,700,000 percent um, from the same time period last year. Um, so there are a lot of Kansans uh, in need and where this would be um, a huge, huge benefit. Okay, absolutely. Now for our folks who are watching, I'm about to actually change this because I think our faces are alternating right now on Facebook. So I'm going to see about a, a split screen approach right now. So I don't want anyone to be be alarmed. Um, oh no, that doesn't that doesn't seem that doesn't seem right. Are we doing like okay. the TikTok switch thing? That well, let's see. Well, we can do this, but hmm, I think we probably go back to speaker view. This seems seems like there would be a lot of black above and below us. So anyway, um, the next piece I, I want to talk about, though, is um, is what's going on with the states. Um, I mean, given that we are a state uh, policy and advocacy organization, and and one of the things that I think state leaders are rightfully concerned about, I know Governor Laura Kelly has talked about this as well, is, you know, we are going to see tax collections go down, uh, particularly sales tax collections go down. So the bill does include some provisions for states, but it, it seems like they're fairly small. Yeah, I mean, it um, It certainly sounds big. So 150 billion, billion with a B, uh, 150 billion dollars was carved out to go to states um, for kind of this, uh, kind of the, the needs related directly to kind of COVID-19. Um, Kansas is receiving 1.25 billion dollars, which is the minimum amount for states. And that's um, the amounts determined by uh, population size. And even though that does sound like a lot of money, it's less than what the federal government sent states during the 2008 recession. And it's really um, not enough to make up for the lost tax revenue um, that, we're going, that we're anticipating due to the kind of economic um, impact of COVID-19. And so without additional um, federal aid, and this is another piece kind of what I mentioned at the top that you know, is a step in the right direction, but there's still still a lot more that needs to be done. Um, more direct aid to states is really going to be necessary, so that states don't have to make difficult cuts um, at a time where we really cannot afford to be um, rolling back needed services. Yeah, and I think that you know, kind of as as we move ahead, just from watching our network of folks, our national partners. The importance of that, you know, that aid to states is something. I mean, that's a topic that is not going to go away. Like that's something that that folks are definitely going to continue um, talking about. Um, now, Emily, we have a question on here. We have some questions, uh, several questions uh, on Facebook about exactly how some of this stuff will work if someone perhaps didn't file in 2018 or 2019 um and uh, adrian olnick our vice president has has said we will look into that i'm not sure if, if you had any uh knowledge about that right now my under my understanding and and uh, um, again this bill was just passed two hours ago so i think we're still re really kind of waiting to see the dust settle and and what additional guidance might be provided um once uh once the bill becomes a law um, but 
what we what I think happened during the Great Recession, if my recalls correctly, is that people could retroactively file um, uh, file and then they would get it. The problem with that is one, is that still what we would do or allow for that I'm unsure of. And then two, um, I think the biggest problem is that if there was an additional hurdle, that just means a further delay in getting um, people that much needed direct cash assistance. Um, but that's certainly something that we can continue to track um, and follow and see what it might mean for particularly those um, low income um, workers who wouldn't necessarily file because it's really, um, they are the ones that, that need this the most. Well, and we, we also had a question. I'm not, I'm not seeing it in, oh, I see. We have a, we're actually having a, a lot of comments now, which is, which is great to everyone. So please uh, keep those coming. Um, someone was asking if this would, po po someone was asking if this would potentially change um, their 2020 taxes. And I, I have no idea about that. I, that's, I mean, because I'm my assumption is this is going out under the auspices of the tax code in in one form or another, but I, I honestly I, I would I wouldn't know that at this point. I'm sure someone will. I'm sure we will have information on that relatively soon. Is the, the so is the question related to whether it would count as additional income? Well, I think it was just phrased as would it affect their taxes this upcoming year? In some I, positive, I, I wouldn't anticipate. So I think the reason why um, the language is saying that it's based either on the 2018, 2019 tax return is because not everyone has filed yet. Um, and now there's uh, an extension. And so I'm, I'm guessing that the reason why it's fluctuating between like the 2018, 2019 tax return is related to, you know, depending which one you might have gotten in. Right. I mean, I also think it's important to note that if you decide to have these these measures, which they've put in for good or ill, to phase out the assistance over a certain income level, they just have to have some sort of way to determine what the income level is. And basically, the way that people have filed taxes is is the is the way you have to do that. Yeah. Yep. Um. Okay. Um. I guess the other another big point here that we would just want to we would want to emphasize is that there is some extra money in there that could theoretically um hopefully not just theoretically hopefully will help the child care industry is that right um yeah so uh this is another area where um the amount provided really does not meet the the need so 6.3 billion dollars overall was um, given to the Administration for Children and Families for Human Services Programs, and of that, that includes 3.5 billion for the Child Care Development and Block Grant, um, which would, could provide immediate assistance to child care providers. Um, child care advocates were advocating for $50 billion, and we got 3.5. By comparison, Boeing, which continues to get a lot of corporate bailouts, um, requested 60, and that happened no problem. Um, the, the main area of concern um, related to the needs of childcare is that childcare was already really struggling as an industry and was, was needing kind of an influx of money and resources before this happened and before a lot of providers have seen, you know, the, the kids aren't, the kids aren't there. Um, with all of these increasing uh, stay-at-home orders, um, uh, parents are caring for their children at home and don't necessarily have a continued um, need for childcare providers. And so childcare providers are really, really, really struggling right now to stay afloat. And if we don't provide them additional resources to help them um, uh, during this kind of interim time, when uh, kind of the crisis of COVID-19 um, is over and people are back to work and we need childcare to get people back working, we're not going to have as strong of an industry um, to, to provide childcare. For working families and so it's really really important that um there is more done at the federal level to provide assistance for the child care industry well and one of the things that i would tell our our viewers or those who follow us who are from the child care industry is that this is something that we are tracking really really closely you know i know emily has been on calls we've been seeing all sorts of information come out about it um and you know child care is in a very difficult and challenging position right now because the government can shut down schools 
Uh, but then if parents work at a hospital or at a grocery store, apparently another like really important place for, for folks to, to show up to work now, if they're law enforcement, whatever else, you know, their kids still need a place to stay and, and hopefully still need a high quality enriching place to stay. And so there's a real tension now out there in the child care field about, you know, how are prepare how are child care providers preparing for this? Are they able to offer services? Are they not? And then how do they how do they stay afloat? So it's definitely something we that's that's in all of our minds and our thoughts, and we're continuing to to track it really carefully. So, um, so Emily, anything else that we particularly wanna wanna hit uh, on the um, on the federal bill that um you know that the the two trillion, and it's amazing with a T, yep. the two tr trillion dollar bill that that passed today. Yeah, I mean, there are other good things. There was additional money. I believe it's $750 million um, for Head Start um, as it relates to child care. Another area where I think that there um, uh, can be more, uh, more that can be done is uh, related to food assistance. So while there was um, $25 billion that was given to food assistance, $16 billion of which went to SNAP, um, there was a push um, to try and increase the amount of benefits right now. Um, and that was not able to be included in the final um, bill as passed. And so there has been some acknowledgement on congressional leaders that this is an area where they'll need to do additional rounds of food assistance. Um, and again, research shows, and unfortunately we have the example of the Great Recession, but we do know that um, food assistance uh, really helped continue to like maintain the economy. Um, and local businesses during the Great Recession. And so um, it had a strong economic impact, particularly in rural areas. Um, and so uh, we know that it's not, it's not just providing direct assistance to families, which is very, very important, but we also know that it's good for the economy. Um, I would also just encourage everyone as, as we move forward um, to, you know, keep track of a couple of things. First of all, if you want to receive any of our materials from KAC through um, through email, uh, because we have daily news roundups, we have newsletters, we have all sorts of things, you can go to kac.org slash sign up, kac.org slash sign up to get that information. Um, also, if you are interested in just hearing the latest official word on COVID-19 in Kansas, we'd really encourage you to go to kdhe.gov slash coronavirus, uh, kdhe.gov slash coronavirus. And that is the, um, that's the official state portal uh, for all sorts of uh, information there. Um, now, Emily, one, one more, one more point, because last week you wrote up um, a blog entry for us about kind of states being prepared to weather times of economic tumult and uncertainty, which we're certainly looks like we're going into one of those right now. So I wondered if you might just say a little bit about about what about that. Yeah, so um the, the blog post was based on a, on a report um, from a national research organization, Center of Budget and Policy Priorities, and they outlined four things um, that they know really help um, kind of curb the impact of a recession. Um, and those four things were um, kind of strong unemployment insurance benefits. And we talked um, obviously about um, the changes that were made at the federal level. Uh, Kansas last week um, extended our, uh, the length of unemployment um, insurance benefits to from 16 weeks to 26 weeks, which is the federal maximum. So that's um, a really good thing. Uh, Kansas could still continue to make it stronger by increasing the amount of um, the benefit. So that's one other um, piece uh, that could be really helpful. Um, and making sure that folks that are eligible are um, taking advantage of the benefit. Um, not all um, 
Kansans that are eligible for unemployment insurance are enrolled. And so we wanna make sure, um, especially right now, that people who are eligible are, um, are getting it. Uh, the second component is adequate reserves. And so this is kind of how much money is left over in the piggy bank. Um, states, unlike the federal government, um, can't overspend <laughs> uh, and, and, go, and go into debt, right? Um, and so- uh, Or at least they have to work much, much more, have to work much harder to do it. Right. Um, <laughs> And so uh, making sure that there is enough reserve. And so Kansas a couple of years ago set up a rainy day fund. Um, and I would say right now, this is a rainy day. Uh, the bad news is that Kansas doesn't have any money in the fund. And so we wanna make sure that we're um, uh, one, I mean, it is really important right now that we are not cutting resources or cutting funds to um, help uh, Kansas families. Um, but at the same time, we also need to understand that it's important, um, whether now or in the future, that we set up the rainy day fund and have a strong ending balance to use in times like these. Um, the third uh, kind of piece um, that can really help with recessions is accessible Medicaid programs. Um, obviously, thinking about health right now is the top of everyone's minds, um, but we know that um, with recessions and, and, and we're seeing it right now with the COVID-19 and, and, and all of the um, unemployment and layoffs, you know, so many people's health insurance is tied to their employment. And if we're seeing high unemployment, we're going to see high uninsured rates. And that's why um, making sure that um, there's Medicaid expansion so that adults uh, are eligible. I mean, so all folks, but particularly thinking about um, adults uh, are able to access um, health insurance and to stay enrolled and that will keep um, them healthy, healthy and it'll keep our state healthy um, and making sure that we're not tying things um, like work requirements to Medicaid expansion because during a recession, um, that's going to really limit who is um, able and eligible to receive those benefits. And then lastly, the fourth piece, which wasn't included, the fourth component, which wasn't included in the blog post, but um, uh, access to higher education a lot of times during recessions. Um, it's a good time for people to go back to uh, school and get the skills um, that they'll be able to use and implement um, during kind of the economic recovery. Okay, um, actually, so just to do some real-time fact checking here, the address I gave a little bit ago was uh, a bit off. There's a correct version for the KDHE's coronavirus uh, website in the comments. Uh, you can also go to kdheks.gov slash coronavirus, and that should uh, should uh, get you there. Um, that's kdheks.gov slash coronavirus. Um, there was also a question, uh, again, from our friend Quinn at Appleseed about Hi. the, yes, indeed, uh, about the possibility of the you know, this bill has been called phase, this federal bill that passed today has been called phase three and asking about the possibility of the phase four bill uh, and what it might include. Um, I know that uh, there's a bit of a partisan divide it appears on this topic at present. Uh, many Democrats have been saying that there is obviously going to be a phase four and we need to start talking about it now while there has been some GOP uh, reaction that we need to just take a little bit and see how it works. But uh, Emily, I wondered if you'd heard anything about possible components of a, of a phase four. I, I, I don't know what they are working on um, for sure related to phase four, but I think that there is a lot more that can be done as I, as I talked about the increase to SNAP benefits, um, the, uh, the um, broadening or the e uh, making it easier for uh, potential non-filers um, or undocumented folks to um, receive the direct uh, assistant payments. I also think um, uh, expanding eligibility um, related to the paid family and uh, sick leave components, which was part of the second package, not this one that passed today, um, that uh, there are still a lot of folks that wouldn't be covered as, um, as that legislation stands right now. And so I think um, there's been some discussion about needing to, to broaden that. And then finally, I mean, 
I, I think a lot more needs to be done with um, related to the child care funding um, than what was provided in this bill. Absolutely. So that's, my, that's my wish list. For <laughs> I, and I think everyone uh, who's been following this and who's been looking at the potential extent of the need that's out there understands that, you know, there is a, I mean, there's a lot being done. There's a lot that's immediately planned to be done, but even, you know, beyond the near term and beyond the, like the midterm, there are going to be so many longer term things that, that need to be done. Um, I want to just say thanks too to to Scott Engelmeyer, who's in our in the comments too, giving some uh, information to folks, um, and just thank everybody for for watching this. Um, I I do feel like we're we're a little bit at a half hour here, and I don't want to keep people for too long, uh, but I did want to to just say that from my perspective, and I think uh, from a lot of us at KAC, you know, this is a an unprecedented time. Uh, we are living through some some real history right at this moment. Uh, it's it's challenging. It's difficult. It's sometimes scary. Um, there's a lot of news every day from a lot of directions. Um, but I think that for us, you know, we have a real clarity of mission, and you know, to make Kansas the best state to raise and be a child. And you know that does doesn't just include kids because it involves the parents and everyone who uh, surrounds those children and lifts them up. And I mean, I think to me, kind of every day, that's a that's a great goal to to be able to have and to be able to continue working toward. And and I think that's what we're that's what we're going to keep doing uh, through whatever kind of means we can. Um, so Emily, I didn't know if you had any any words as well. I mean. I think as thinking about Camps Action for Children and our focus on children um, and as it relates to kind of COVID-19, you know, um, it looks like um, that kids are less affected by COVID-19 than um, adults, particularly older adults. But what kids are um, still going to be impacted by is really all of the kind of the consequences and ramifications of this health crisis. And, and we know that when um, families are stressed, whether it's from health challenges or economic challenges that may come from this, that, that kids are going to be stressed. And so there's going to be um, a lot of needs uh, for, for kids and families to make sure um, that they are, uh, you know, able to kind of handle and strive during, um, during our current times. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd really encourage everyone to continue to, um, uh, track what's going on and, and um, you know, advocate for, for the ones uh, that uh, we care about, Kansas kids and families, and um, stay home. <laughs> that's, that's right. And uh, we will be there with you uh, in, in our own homes as well. So thanks so much uh, to everyone for watching, uh, and hopefully we will see you again uh, very soon. Thanks, Emily. Bye.